right, good evening. Thanks for having me, giving me this opportunity to come and deliver the Word of God to you again. I always enjoy this. The topic of tonight, oh yeah, before I start, I appreciate you being here. I really do, because this is a very big day. As a matter of fact, to a lot of guys, this is the most important day of the year. You know what today is? You know what's going to go on in about 15 minutes? The first preseason football game. <laughs> All right, hang on, guys. I'll have you out of here by halftime. <laughs> All right, the, uh, the, the name, the title of the message I'm going to give you tonight is called Stay Frosty. And some of you are saying, say what? A lot of you that know me know what that term means. So by the time tonight's message is over with, you all are going to know what that term means. But more so than that, you're going to know what that term can do for you. Stay Frosty is a military term. It has its genesis, its creation in military circles. And the reason it has its genesis in military circles is because when you are in the military, and I was in the Navy, I was a hospital corpsman in the Navy, and that was my job. That's what I did. I took x-rays, I did vasectomies, I did urological X, um, procedures and all that. That was my job. But every military person also has a collateral duty called the watch. Now, the watch is what you do after the normal hours of operation. And what you do on your watch is you walk around and patrol the area that you're responsible for. And you're patrolling it to keep it safe, the property safe, but more so the people safe that may be inhabiting like a barracks or a fence post or something like that. Now, I served many watches when I was in the Navy, starting in boot camp in Orlando, Florida, hospital course school in San Diego, and two urology clinics in Portsmouth, Virginia, and Bethesda, Maryland. And... These are duties that you have that could be either be overnight for four hours or for 24 hours, depending on the situation. When I was in the clinics, my duties were 24 hours long. When I was in boot camp, it was just a four-hour shift. And wouldn't you know it, it would always be between 12 a.m. and 4 a.m. Couldn't go to sleep, couldn't fall back to sleep. Anyway, this term, stay frosty, is commonly used. It has this real genesis and my son's going to love this, and all of you uh, Semper Fies out there, it started in the Marine Corps. Um, and basically the term means to stay awake, to stay alert, to be on your toes. The first time I heard this term was in July of 1976 in boot camp when I was relieving somebody that was on the 8 to 12 watch, and as he handed the flashlight to me and the gun, which was a plastic gun at that time, he said, Randy, I am relieved, and I said, I relieve you, and he said, stay frosty. And I knew what the term meant, and it's kind of stuck with me, although I really haven't started using it until the last few years, and primarily in Celebrate Recovery. And I use it as a term that means to somebody that's struggling with an issue, stay frosty. See things for what they are. When things start to get a little crazy in your life, who's causing it? You have to be ready for these things. So if we're constantly on guard to the tricks of the enemy, we're more likely to resist him. So that being said, we're going to dig into this stay frosty term tonight. And I'm going to be honest with you, about halfway through it, we're going to be going, touching some areas that are going to make a few of you a little uncomfortable. It's going to give you a lot to think about. And then we're going to touch on another area for things that we can do to increase our ability to stay frosty and resist the devil that he may flee from us. So you ready? Okay. As I said, it's a military term. Basically, it means to stay aware, stay awake, and it's an admonishment to stay alert on one's toes. Does the concept of staying frosty sound familiar to you? Let's look at it this way. We know that our enemy, you saw that video from Financial Peace. Did you see the scene when the female lion was chasing the antelope? Well, that's exactly what our enemy does to us. As a matter of fact, why don't we put the first scripture up, which is 1 Peter chapter 8, I mean chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. This scripture says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in faith, your faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. 
So let's take a look at this. Let's break this scripture down and get a better understanding of exactly what some of these key terms mean. Be sober. What does that mean? Most people say, don't get drunk. Well, that's a common use of the word, but that's not what the author of the scriptures wrote back when he originally penned this. Strong's 3525 says that the use of the term sober in the context in which the original scripture was written means to be self-disciplined, to think rationally and not foolishly. Be vigilant. Strong's 1127 says that as used here, it means to keep awake, to watch, to be watchful. So being sober means to be self-disciplined, to think rationally, not to be foolish. And being vigilant means to be alert to the spiritual pitfalls of life and take the appropriate steps to make certain that those things do not happen, that we don't stumble. And we do this, we know we need to do this because our adversary, the devil, can we all agree that our adversary is the devil here, the enemy of our soul? He walks around like that roaring lion waiting for us to fall. See, Satan is our avowed enemy, our adversary, and he never ceases from being hostile to us. He is constantly accusing us before God. Like that roaring lion, he is cunning and cruel. And have you ever seen those Animal Planet shows where the lions wait in the brush for the antelope to wander away from the herd? And as soon as that antelope wanders away, he is defenseless. And the lions usually have a tasty meal. So the lions attack when they least expect it. The enemy of our soul attacks us when we least expect it. And he desires to not only attack us, but he desires to destroy us. So how do we respond to these attacks? Have any of you ever been attacked by the enemy? Um, I hope all of you have. The greater the threat you are to him, the more he's going to attack you. So if he's not attacking you, you're not a threat to him. So what's going on there? The scriptures tells us that we must resist him. We are not commanded to run. Notice it says resist him. When you resist, you don't turn your back and flee. You face it and you prepare yourself for the fight of your life. And how do we do this fight? Well, we're going to call on the old reliable Ephesians chapter. Chapter 6, verses 10. We call down the armor of God to fight this battle. Listen, we're not to flee here because victory doesn't come when you run. Only Victory only comes when we remain committed to the Lord because he is greater than the enemy. One of my favorite scenes from the movie, The Hunt for Red October, and I love that movie. You know, it's been on quite frequently, is when the U.S. squad has just boarded the Russian submarine and they go to the bridge, the command center. And they meet the Russian squad that's trying to defect to the United States. And if you haven't seen the movie, I just gave it away. If you haven't seen the movie, where you been for the last 30 years? So the American squad is here. The Russian squad is here. Now, nobody on the American squad, as far as they know, speaks Russian. So the Russian captain, Marcus Ramius, sees something, and he makes a joke to one of his fellow officers about it. Jack Ryan, who's on the American side, is a CIA agent, but he only wrote books, so he says. He laughs at the comment, and this kind of catches the Russian captain off guard, and he, and he turned to Ryan and said, you speak Russian? And Jack Ryan said, yes, I do. It is wise to know the tactics and the language of one's enemy, don't you think? And the captain of the Soviet submarine said, yes, it is. That's a very powerful scene, but it's one that gets overlooked. It's important for us to understand the tactics of the enemy. We must be aware of his ways, obviously, and be on guard for them because he's going to continue to attack us regardless of whether we're ready or not. Alertness to Satan's intentions will help you avoid these encounters with him. You know, resisting Satan is much like breaking a bad habit. Very often we continue in our sin because we do it so much almost without thinking. In the same way, we fail to take a stand against Satan because we are not consciously aware of his power and his activity in the world. And quite frankly, I don't think we take him seriously enough. We fail to realize the seriousness of this thing called spiritual warfare. And spiritual warfare, 
Like we said earlier, it is important to know the enemy, his character, his tactics, and his weapons. When we know these things, we will be able to clearly identify his attempts to influence us and then take the necessary steps to resist. We need to stay frosty. Along those lines, perhaps an answer to the question of how do we stay frosty is this. We know that the enemy, our adversary, the devil, prowls around, he hovers around, he sneaks around, he pursues us, he watches us, he wait, he's waiting for us to make a mistake. Let our guard down. So we know this. So why do we find it so difficult to, to fight him? I guess you could say this one thing, and this is kind of the crust of one of these biscuits that we're going to um, dine on tonight. I guess you could say that the devil is passionate in his pursuit of us. He is relentless. He's like the world's worst used car salesman. And I apologize if there are any used car salesmen in the audience here tonight, but you all know the stereotype I'm talking about. They are relentless. They hound you. Can we agree that the enemy, the devil, is relentless in his pursuit of us? Can we agree on that? Can we say that the enemy is passionately, passionately pursuing us? Can we agree that the enemy is relentless in his pursuit of us? He never tires. Can we say that he's waiting to chase us, pursue us, and waiting for, to take us out until we take our last breath on earth? I mean, this is a lifelong fight, folks. It's not going to be over until either Jesus comes and takes us home or until we take our last breath. So, can we agree to these things? Do we, are we at a consensus? Can I get a show of hands? Do we all agree that the enemy relentlessly pursues us? Everybody should be raising their hand. There shouldn't be a hand down. Okay, so if we're in agreement on this, I have a question for you. It's rhetorical, so you don't have to raise your hand. Here's the question. If we can all agree that the enemy of our soul is passionately, persistently, relentlessly, endlessly pursuing us with unending abandon, why can't or why don't we pursue Christ in the same manner? Listen, I don't have all the answers here. I wish I did, but I do know this. Staying frosty isn't merely a term of endearment. It's not a flippant, hip, coy, cool saying that I use carelessly. I say it with sincerity and with a serious undertone. And it's a term that is used to imply that when we use the tools to stay alert, to see the things for what they are, and then respond appropriately, to gear up, to man up, to cowboy up. You guys know that from the Red Sox thing a couple of years ago. Well, you know what? It applies in our spiritual warfare just as well. We have to man up with this stuff. We can't be wimps when it comes to spiritual warfare. We need these tools to fight this battle because at the end of the day, that's exactly what it is. It's a battle. I would also argue this, unless we are pursuing Christ with the same passion that the enemy is pursuing us, we will not win this battle. Think about it. It would be nice if our battles with the enemy were as easy as the smash the mole game that you see at the carnivals and fairs. You know the one I'm talking about, the one where the, the mole pops up and you take that anvil and you smash him on the head, then another one pops up and you smash that, then another one pops up and you smash that. It would be nice if it were that easy. You know, that game tests our reflexes, our strength, and our alertness. This kind of sounds a lot like what Peter is telling us, isn't it? Be sober. Be vigilant. Resist him. Let's take a look at another scripture here. Let's look at James chapter 4, verses 7 through 8a. This scripture tells us to resist the devil, and he will flee. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. I love that scripture. It tells us what we need to do. Draw near to God, and he'll draw nearer to us. There are two commands here that we must follow if we are to successfully resist the devil. First, we must submit to God by abandoning our selfish pride. Submitting to the Lord also involves putting on the whole armor of God, an image that includes everything from placing our faith in God to immersing ourselves in the truth of his word. Secondly, we must resist any temptation that the devil throws our way. If his attempts are not received, if they are not accepted by us, if we fight against them using the tools that God has given us, the enemy has no choice 
but to flee. Even if it's just for a little while, that's all you need to break away from that very temptation that you're facing. We have to remember that if we employ the tools that God has given us, we belong to his army. Now, about this armor of God, it's forward-facing. It's meant for fighting. It is meant to move forward, not backward. The armor, as we know, covers everything on the front of our body so that when we face the enemy, we are protected by what God has for us. If we turn our backs, that's our vulnerable area. He's going to pounce, sink his claws into us, and we're gone. In our own strength, our own strength, Satan is a formidable foe. But when we are armored with the armor of God, we can stand and withstand his attacks. Here's the thing. This is an interesting fact. We know that Satan is already defeated, right? I mean, when you get to the end of Revelation, we win, right? That's really cool. That's good news. But until that time, we cannot take his works lightly because until the end comes, Satan and his demons will wage a daily war against our hearts and our minds, daily, hourly, minute by minute. But here's the real kicker here. Satan will have no power over the Christian who submits to the authority of God, the authority of Jesus Christ, and puts on that armor. Amen, Amen, brother. As Christians, we are under God's supreme protection and care. His unlimited, unlimited, unlimited resources are at our disposal. And while we may be aware of Satan's work, we must be even more aware of the power that we have in our one true higher power, Jesus Christ. Satan's a defeated foe. But why do you think he tries so hard to bring us down? Why do you think he tries so hard to bring Christians down? He does this so he can mock us, so we can be mocked. Whenever a Christian gets down, whenever it's, when Satan wins a battle or a temptation, he's out there to quick to accuse us, to judge us, to throw it in our face, such that others around us can say, what, you're engaging in that behavior and you're a Christian? Why should I follow Christ? That's why our walk has to be above everything. But we're going, to, we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. Because listen, you know, this stuff sounds really good. If only it were that easy. But it's not. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able But with the temptation will also come a way of escape. Oh, right, that you may be able to bear it. We're familiar with this scripture. It's probably one of the first scriptures we learn after coming to Christ. And it gives us comfort and peace to know that God will give us the grace and power to overcome any temptation that we face. Because any temptation that we face can't be more than we can bear. The scripture says it. But you know, many people take a false confidence in this scripture. They believe that this scripture implies that it will be an external force, an external event that provides their way of escape. For instance, when we're tempted, I have had people say, and I've actually had people tell me this, they were waiting for the phone to ring, a knock on the door, the dog to bark, the laundry to finish, the baby to wake up. You get the idea. They are waiting for something else. There may, okay, I'm going to use an example. They may be sitting at a computer after spending four hours there engaging in online betting, which is a, could be a sin for somebody if it's, if it's out, of a, out of proportion. And they know they shouldn't do any more. Or maybe they're sitting in front of their computer thinking, geez, do I go to this porn site? Or maybe they're sitting at their dining room table with a bottle of wine. And they're saying, I shouldn't do this. I'm tempted. I really want to take this drink, but I don't want to do that. I, can't, I don't want to do this. I want to fight this. Oh, Lord, where's that scripture? Oh, provide escape. Well, where's my escape? Where's my knock on the door? Where's my telephone call? Most of the time, it doesn't work that way. I would say all of the time, it doesn't work that way. But, but statistically speaking, I got to give credit for the 0.001% of time when it does happen. 
They are believing that something will happen to distract them and pull them from, to rescue them from the temptation that's before them. Quite frankly, I don't think any of those things matter. I don't think we should rely on those things to rescue us from the temptation that is before us. The answer is really quite simple. When tempted, I believe what Paul is referring to in 1 Corinthians 10, 13 relates to this, Jesus Christ. I believe that we must choose Christ over the temptation. That's the way out. We call upon God to give us the armor that we need to save us, to rescue us, so that we can fight through that temptation, and we submit to the power and might of Jesus Christ. We choose Christ, not the temptation that's going to lead us into sin. We know that Christ is the way out. He's the way, the truth, and the light. If if we abide in him, he abides in us. He gives us what we need. Overcoming temptation, like recovery, is a choice followed by a process. The choice is Jesus Christ. The process is the overcoming of the temptation. You know, this is really powerful stuff here. It's so simplistic in its development, but so difficult in its employment. If it were so easy, if it were easy to resist, if it was easy as pie to resist the temptations that come before us, the sinful temptations that come before us, that pull us into sin, that keep us down and beaten, feeling shameful and guilty of how we're living our lives, if it was so easy to resist Satan in this regard, there would be no need for a program like Celebrate Recovery. There would be no need for AA. There would be no need for therapy. There would be no need for counseling. If it were that easy to resist. But we all know, and I include everybody in this room, we all know it's not that easy. And the reason it's hard is because we are human. And it's our flesh that drives us. The truth is, we like our sinful pleasures. We like the material things that we have. We don't always choose to say or do the right thing. And now I'm going to take my first tangent, and I'm going to give you the five-minute lesson on the cycle, the the physiology of the addiction cycle. Now, addictions run the gamut from A to Z. I'm going to use ice cream tonight because it's something that everybody can relate to, right? Everybody likes ice cream. No, I can't say that because 1% of you might not. Most of you like ice cream. Now, understand, ice cream could be alcohol. Ice cream could be pornography. Ice cream could be Oxycontin, painkillers. Ice cream could be gambling. Ice cream could be anger. Ice cream could be bitterness. Ice cream could be spending money and being a hoarder. Ice cream could be food. Whatever your drug of choice is, that's what it is. But we'll stay with ice cream. It's less threatening. Okay, I like ice cream. I especially like peach ice cream. It's my favorite. But I have to be careful about how much I eat because I'm a diabetic. So I try to monitor with a moderate degree of success, right, honey? (laughs) I do enjoy my trips to Dairy Queen, which are few and far between, by the way. But I like ice cream, so we're going to use ice cream in this example of why it's so hard to deny our flesh and to say no to the devil. I'm driving home from work one day, and out of nowhere, a thought pops into my head. Ice cream. Now, isn't it amazing how many times you're just binding your own business, going along, you may be working, you may be cutting your grass, and all of a sudden, a random thought out of nowhere pops in your head. Who do you think could put that there? So anyway, I'm driving down the road going 65 miles an hour on my way home, and all of a sudden, boom, a thought comes in my mind, ice cream. Now, there's this little thing in your brain called the nucleus acebus, okay? Okay? That's the center of your brain that controls your pleasure. 
It's also the part of the brain where dopamine is created. And we all have the ability to create dopamine. You can't deny it. You can't stop it. It's part of the way God made you. Dopamine is one of those things that has both a good use and a not so good use. So anyway, that thought of ice cream comes into my head and boom, instantly that center of the brain, the pleasure center of the brain is releasing dopamine. Now, it doesn't take very long for the dopamine to go from the nucleus of sebums to the hippocampus. Now, the hippocampus is the part of the brain where the memories are stored. And all of a sudden, that dopamine triggers the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is, is recalling, going through the data banks, recalling every memory that you had of consuming peach ice cream. Almost before you can blink your eyes, the dopamine has already gone through the hippocampus. It is now going into the amygdala. And the amygdala, the amygdala, yeah, that's where it gets in there. And the amygdala releases certain neurotransmitters into your body that provide a conditioned response to the stimulus that it's receiving. So, going 65 miles an hour, I haven't even gone 10 feet down the highway before that random thought that popped in my mind has already conditioned my brain to say, I want ice cream. 65 miles an hour, 10 feet, just like that. The thought has gone from I want to my body actually beginning to start to crave the ice cream. So on my way home, I'm thinking more about this ice cream. I know exactly where it is. It's in the lower part of the freezer to the right. <laughs> and I'm thinking about this, and the more I think about it, guess what happens? The more dopamine in my pleasure center gets released. And the more dopamine in my pleasure center gets released, it flows all the way through the hippocampus again. And more memories come up. And then after it's released there, it goes to the amygdala that says, you want this even more. So by the time I'm getting home, I'm frothing at the mouth for peach ice cream. I pull into the garage, run out, burst into the kitchen. I don't even say hello to my wife. Go right to the refrigerator, open it up, pull it out, grab it. There it is, Briar's peach ice cream. Pull the top off, get a spoon. And my brain is telling me it's so good, so refreshing. You're happy now. Ooh, you're satisfied now. So you eat another scoop and another scoop. And then all of a sudden you stop. And your wife's standing there looking at you like this. The half dozen people in your dining room are sitting there looking at you like this because you forgot about the people that were coming over. So you start to feel, oh, man, what do I do? You start to feel bad. You start to feel guilty. You start to feel shameful. And here's the kicker, because you ate so much ice cream, you're full, and you can't eat the delicious dinner your wife prepared. That's one day. You do this repeatedly. Every day, thoughts get put in your head. I want this. I want this ice cream. So next week, three or four scoops doesn't cut it anymore. Now you're eating half a gallon. And the week after that, you're eating the whole gallon. And then two weeks after that, you're eating two gallons because what happens over time is, is that your body gets accustomed to this and it takes more dopamine to be resolved and it takes more of the substance that your body craves to satisfy yourself, to achieve the same level of satisfaction, to reach that ennui, to reach that happiness. Let's put it into another example. You hurt your leg, your knee. You have surgery, meniscectomy, whatever, arthroscopy. Doctor gives you a prescription for, let's just say Percocet. Percocet's an opioid. Heroin is an opioid. Oxycontin is an opioid. So anyway, he gives you a prescription for Percocet. They're better at it now, but they used to give you a 30-pill subscription. So you... Take one, because your leg hurts, right? You've had surgery. Oh, God, you've had surgery, you poor thing. You take that Percocet. 
Percocet like a, is an opioid, and opioid is a time-released medication. That means if it's supposed to last eight hours, you get a little bit released here, 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 so that in the eight-hour time frame covered by that opioid, you're happy. You feel good. Your leg doesn't hurt. You're in a state of euphoria. Woo-hoo. What? Move my leg? It's so bad that you laugh at reruns of Gilligan's Island. Okay, the next day, they tell you you need to start walking on it. But that hurts. I better take a Percocet. Because you like the way it feels. You like the way your body feels. You like the way your mind feels. You're happy. You're in la-la land. Then the next day, you take another one. And guess what? Three days, you're hooked. So your wife says, what did you do with those pills? You say, oh, I'm just going to throw them away. I don't need to take them. But you take them, you hide them, and you take them. And after your 30 pills for prescription is up, you go back to your doctor and you tell him that your knee hurts really bad and that you need this pain medication. So he writes you another prescription for another 30-day supply of Percocet, and you take those. And then after that, he won't write you anymore, so you go to another doctor. And maybe he has sympathy for you, and he writes you another prescription and then another one, and then you go to him, and he won't write you anymore, so now you're kind of messed up. What do I do? Because by then, you're hooked. Not only are you hooked, you are deeply hooked. So what happens then? So then you hear about somebody selling it on the street. So then you go down to the street corner. You make some phone calls, and you find out where you can get it, and you pay 100 bucks a pill for it. And you do that. And you know what? It's easy to tap 100 bucks out of your ATM. That doesn't raise a lot of questions. But you do that 300 times. That's a lot of money. So then you can't get it on the street corner anymore. And by this time, the dopamine, because you're thinking about it so much that the dopamine is just flushing through your system, telling all the components of your brain that you are going to die unless you get this. So then what do you do? You can't get it from your doctor anymore. You can't get it from the street corner guy anymore. So now what do you do? Well, let's see. Op- Percocet, Oxycontin is an opioid. What else is an opioid? Heroin. And they got this real cheap stuff coming up from Mexico now. You can get a hit of heroin, heroin for five bucks. Comes in a balloon. And here's the thing. They will deliver it to you like pizza. So you get that stuff. The only problem is a lot of that stuff is laced with fentanyl. What was it, Nancy? 30-something thousand people died from heroin last year. You know how many people died from guns in the United States last year? Less than 12,000, but you hear all about it on the papers. 30,000 people die from opioid overdose, and you don't hear a thing except on the local news, and then after that, it's gone. This is why people like doctors, professionals, doesn't matter what your education, what your job is, you know, the drugs don't care. Satan doesn't care what you do. He wants to get you hooked. That's why these people can't break their cycle of addiction because their human body is programmed to say, I want this. Nobody grows up wanting to be a heroin addict. Nobody grows up wanting to be a porn addict. Nobody grows up thinking that they're going to be a a hoarder. Nobody grows up thinking that they're going to be struggling with codependency. But here's the thing. We are what we consume. We take these drugs, we take these substances into our body, and our body gets used to them. Sugar is a killer. To me, maybe not to some of you, but to a diabetic, sugar is a killer. So try to say no to it when somebody's waving it to you in the face at the, in, the, in your face at a family function, when you don't want to offend Aunt Irma because she baked this pie just for you. That's why it's so hard to resist temptation. That's why it's so hard to say no. That's why it's so hard to choose Jesus 
over this. And that's why we feel so guilty about it when we fall. Because we can't beat it. We feel defeated. We feel worthless. We feel shameful. You think we want to do this stuff? No. You think we want to be one of those people? Well, I would tell you, there's a group of those people out there right now that are getting healing. And yes, I am one of those people. Here's the, the truth. The truth is, is that maybe something was done to us when we were kids that has impacted us all of our life. Maybe we were physically, emotionally, or sexually abused. So this thing drives our behavior, impacts the way we think. In CR, that's what we call a hurt. The truth is, is that maybe we were hurt by somebody's words or their actions. Maybe they betrayed us. And we will deal with this through our attitudes like anger, bitterness, unforgiveness. That's called a hang-up. The truth is, is that maybe we had to rely on someone else or something else to help us cope with the pain that we felt, that we kept buried, buried in our hearts, that we internalized. The truth is, is that maybe we felt like we didn't belong, that no one liked us, and that in order to fit in, we engaged in certain behaviors, did things to our bodies, allowed things to be done to our bodies, consumed substances that helped us fit in to be part of a social group. And now we find that we can't stop. That's a habit. The bottom line is that at some level, all of us, all of us have something that hurts us, that we internalize, that motivates us to make the choices that we do. Sin, in its most simplistic form, is all about choice. And it's been that way ever since Eve took the first bite of the apple. So how does all this circle back to this stay frosty thing? How does all this tie into staying frosty? Simply this, staying frosty is all about being aware of the internal mechanisms that drive our behaviors such that we can, become, we can become more aware of, more sensitive to the external factors that, when coupled with those internal mechanisms, cause us to fall, to sin, to not choose Christ. That's what staying frosty is in a nutshell. So how do we do this? How do we stay frosty to resist the devil that he may flee? that we may gain victory over our hurt, hang up, or habit. Right now, I think there are three basic things that we can do. The first is what we call trigger awareness. Trigger awareness is simply being aware of those things that trigger your internal mechanisms to want for you, that incite you, to entice you to want to engage in a certain behavior that your physical body is accustomed to or desires. For example... If you struggle with porn, and statistically speaking, 67% of the men in this room do. Don't look with disdain, women, because 35% of you do. So if you struggle with porn, don't put yourself in a position where you're alone with the computer or whatever device it is that you use to engage in your activity. If you have a problem with gambling, stay away from the casinos or the corner store where they sell the scratch game tickets or the online betting on your computer. If you have an issue with codependency, recognize that you can't fix someone. Only God can do that. And no matter how hard you try, you cannot take away someone's pain. Here's a simple rule. If you can't swim, you don't jump in the deep end, do you? Being aware of your trigger mechanisms is being aware of the things that turn your on switch on. They are the things that launch you into the behavior that you don't want to do, but you find yourself doing anyway. Kind of like Paul in Romans. We know that scripture. That's another one we learn quickly. I know what I shouldn't do, but I do it. I do what I don't want to do. What a wretched person am I? Why do I do this? Because it's the sinful nature within us. Thank you, Eve. We say with a bit of chagrin. The second thing that we can do to stay frosty is to become accountable to someone. Remember the show, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? 
They had that lifeline that you called, that person, that friend that you called to help you answer the question. Well, an accountability partner can be that lifeline for you. It's that call that you can make when you find yourself in a situation where you're tempted. But here's the thing. It's a call that you make, not them. See, I sponsor a bunch of guys that struggle with a number of different issues. And I get calls at all hours of the day. And I always encourage, when somebody asks me for my number, I always encourage that they call me before they fall. While the temptation is still before them. Because if they do that, well, I'll tell you what will happen when we do that in just a minute. But guess what happens? Unfortunately, most of them call after the fall. And they feel horrible. They feel terrible. They feel guilty. They feel beat down. Because that's what Satan does to you. See, that's the great enticement that Satan lures put, puts before us. He puts this big, beautiful thing that our lives look at, like that apple. It was pleasing to the eye, and I'm sure it tasted good, and our bodies want it. And as soon as we eat it, as soon as we take part in it, the veil is removed, and we feel horrible. We feel like, we feel horrible. See, Temptation, especially in accountability, the temptation that we face, it requires us to make a decision. Are we going to engage in the behavior or are we going to disengage? My second tangent of the night. We're almost done. See, I look at temptation like a telephone call from Satan. How many of you have ever gotten a call from a political person running for office, and they say, hey, how you doing? We, you know, blah, blah, blah. Oh, and you know what? We're running this campaign. This is a really great guy. And uh, by the way, we're looking for $50. Can you give us $50 to support this candidate? And you say, I really can't because it's been a tough year and I don't have that. Okay, how about 40 No, I really can't do that. You know, it would really help us. How about 30 And they will whittle you all the way down because you're still on the phone. And usually what happens, when you get down to 10, people start to think. They start to rationalize, okay, I can give them $10. So you say, yes, here's $10. But they don't want cash. They don't want your check. They want your credit card. Because once you give them your credit card number, you have just opened the door, and they can go in and see all about you. They know your spending habits. So the next time they call, they won't be asking for 50. They'll be asking for a more reasonable amount, 20 or 30. But why did you still keep them on the phone when they call or tell a marketer calls? Hi, my name is Veronica, and I'm... How many of you, how many of you get those? What do you do? You hang up. See, Satan wants to keep you on the phone. The longer you stay on the phone, the longer he, the more chance he knows he has of getting you to fall. He knows this. And he's going to say all the right things. Listen, like I said, he's the world's worst car salesman. He's the world's worst salesman because he will constantly entice you with 99.9% .9 of the truth in hopes that you'll bite. And then he'll reel you in. See, I look at temptation like the phone call. And this is why it relates to accountability. If I'm tempted, Satan's got me on the phone encouraging me to do something that I don't want to do because, I, A, I know it's wrong, and, B, I've shut that door a long time ago. I hang up the phone. Then I pick up the phone, and I call somebody. Hey, brother, man, I am really being attacked by the enemy. Can you pray with me? You've broken the connection. You have broken the connection that Satan had, and now you're starting to gain momentum. You're putting that armor on by calling somebody to what? To pray for you. Using the word of God to break that connection even more. So the next time Satan comes calling you when you're sitting there trying to ponder, trying to think, trying to rationalize, because Satan will tell you, you deserve it. You work hard. You earned it. She turned you down. She rejected you. So do it anyway. He'll tell you anything you want to hear. He will tell you what your body craves for. 
He'll even tell you where to go get it. I mean, I've talked to a lot of people that struggle with drugs, and they will tell me, and I didn't even know how to get to that place. But somehow, I found my way down. Well, surprise, surprise, surprise. How do you think you found your way there? I'm sorry. Hang up on the phone. Pick up the phone and call your accountability partner. Call someone you trust. Think of it this way. When you hang up on Satan and you pick up the phone to call somebody, you're choosing God because that person that you call is going to pray for you. You know, in some circles, we even go pick them up wherever they are to extract them from the situation. Accountability partners can and do help. And the reason I know is because I see it every week in Celebrate Recovery. It's one of the first things we tell people to do when they come in the doors for the first time. Before you leave tonight, get a couple of phone numbers of the guys in your small group so that you can, or the women in your small group so that you can call somebody because you will be attacked. And you need to call somebody that can help you fight your way through it. But we have a couple of rules about being accountable with someone. One, they must be the same gender as you. Two, they must be someone that you trust because you're going to open up yourself to your darkest secrets. Three, it must be someone whose walk matches their talk, who has sobriety over their hurt, habit, hang up. And four, they need to be walking in the spirit, not the flesh. Accountability works. Pastor Pete, Pastor Roy, they've talked about it before. It's a common theme here. Even if you don't go to a recovery program, but you come to church and you want to know more about the gospel, you want to know more about what victory does, what we believe in, what our vision is, how we operate, get a phone number and call someone. The third thing that we can do to break the spirit, to, break, uh, to stay frosty, is to incorporate into our lives what are called the spiritual disciplines. The spiritual disciplines are those practices that are found in Scripture that promote spiritual growth among believers in the gospel of Jesus Christ. They are habits of devotion that have been practiced by the people of God since the times the Bible was written. They are activities, not attitudes. They are things that we do, sometimes alone, sometimes with a few people, sometimes in a corporate body such as this gathering here tonight. They are things that we do to help us passionately pursue Jesus Christ. So what are they? There's about nine of them, maybe ten. Don't hold that against me. The first one is what's called Bible intake. You may know this as reading and studying Scripture. Principle 7, I love this, listen to this. Principle 7 of the Celebrate Recovery 8 principle states that we are to reserve a daily time with God for self-examination, Bible reading, and prayer to know God and His will for my life and to gain the power to follow that will. Bible reading isn't just reading the Scripture from cover to cover. It's not seeing how fast you can get through Romans, Numbers, God bless you, um, or any book in the Bible. Reading Scripture is like this. This is the way I read Scripture, and this is why it takes me. This is why I've been a Christian for 15 years, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not ashamed to say that I have still yet to read the entire Bible. When you read Scripture, pick a Scripture. Two, three lines, maybe four. Get your Strong's Concordance out. Read the Scripture. Hmm. Pray about it. Ask God to show you what you are to learn from this Scripture. Get your Concordance out and focus on it. See, like a word, like I did there with sober. I want to see what sober means. So I look in the Concordance and I find sober and I see the verse that I refer to. And it's important to find the verse that you refer to because the Bible was written over thousands of years in different situations. And you want to find the right situation where that word was written because that's important. That's called context. So you find the word and you find what that word meant, how it is translated based on what it meant when it was written. Now, there's a lot of Greek people that study Greek and Hebrew. 
And they are able to tell you, based on certain accents of the Greek or the Hebrew word, what those words meant. Okay? So you do that. And then when you understand what it meant at that point in time, 2,000, 4,000, 6,000 years ago, and you say, well, how does it apply to my life today? How can I use this scripture to help me stay frosty, to fight the battle, to become a better person, to know Jesus Christ better? And I will guarantee you this, there's always an application. I have never yet to read a scripture that didn't have an application. Well, well, what about the shortest verse in the Bible? Jesus wept. Does that have application? Absolutely. If Jesus can cry, so can I. The second spiritual discipline is um, prayer. We are to spend time fervently in prayer. Jesus expects us to pray. And now this can be a personal prayer time, or it can be corporate prayer time as we do here, or it can be prayer time in like an intercessory prayer group. You heard Frank mention earlier, we are a church that prays, and we have an intercessory prayer group that meets every Tuesday night that prays for whoever fills out one of those cards, as well as an assigned prayer list. The third thing that we do is worship. Now, worship isn't just like we did here earlier with the praise and worship team was up here. We raise our hands and we sing. That's part of it. But that in and of itself is not worship. Worship is focusing on and responding to God. We worship God through our obedience to him, through praising him and giving him glory by reading his word and continuing to pray to him. Worship is that God-centered focus and response of our soul to him. It is being preoccupied with God. He needs to be the center of our attention. The fourth spiritual discipline is evangelism. We must be ready, willing, and able to carry out that great commandment, as we heard Frank talk about earlier, to take the gospel to all, no, Frank Wanda talk about earlier, to take the gospel to all nations, teaching them to observe all that I taught you. And if you want to learn more about evangelism, see Brother Charles. He will fill your ear up. The, next, the fifth spiritual discipline is serving. And I love what Pastor Roy, how he addressed this this past Sunday. Jesus was the perfect servant. He did not come to be served, but to serve. And that's the model, quite simply, we need to follow. We need to see the value in others, because if we don't see the value in others, yeah, we need to become more like Jesus. The sixth spiritual discipline is stewardship. We must be judicious in our time, talents, the use of our time, talents, and resources. We must follow the words of Paul in Ephesians um, chapter, five, chapter 5, verse 15, where it says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. We must redeem the time with our resources that we have and not waste any opportunity to serve God and to do his will. Another spiritual discipline is fasting. Fasting is actually um, expected of us. Do you know that? Matthew 6, 16, 17 says, and when you fast, dot, 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 but when you fast, so that tells me that Jesus expects us to fast because he said not if, but when. And fasting is an expectation of somebody that's walking in the spiritual disciplines. Fasting is done with a purpose. And no, weight loss is not a purpose. Weight loss may be a great byproduct of fasting, but it's not the reason that you fast. A biblical purpose is the single most important concept behind fasting. Silence and solitude are another spiritual discipline, and we're almost done. This one catches a lot of people off guard. Solitude is the spiritual discipline of voluntarily and temporarily withdrawing to privacy for spiritual purposes. Now, now we know that Jesus frequently practiced this by going off into the mountains or to the Mount of Olives. It really helps the mind get cleared here. It clears us of all the distractions, and it returns our focus on Jesus. It can be a great way to seek the will of God for your life. The last three. Journaling is a great way to speak to God, to seek God, to see prayers answered, and to see personal growth in Christ. Quite frankly, I think that journaling is not a diary, but a way to document the works and ways of Jesus Christ in your life. I journal one or two times a week. 
You know, sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. But I journal, and it's amazing to go back and look at what's happened. I can see prayers answered. I can see changes in the way that I think as I develop as a Christian. Learning is another spiritual discipline because we must continue to learn about God. We must learn about his kingdom, his ways, his works, his will. And we must understand that our hearts are broadened or touched by what we learn about him. Now, this can be a formal program of study, or it could be a Bible study, or it can be just simply reading a book, as long as you learn something about God that you didn't know going into it. And the last spiritual discipline is perseverance in the disciplines, holding the course, practicing these disciplines with an eye towards eternity, engaging them, incorporating them into our lives. It's challenging. Yeah, I know. I get that because it takes time, and time is precious. I get that. But the more time you make for God, the more time he'll give you to become as complete as we can. Each of these disciplines has a function in our spiritual development in our Christian life. I guarantee you that if you start to do some, and I know so many of you already do some of these spiritual disciplines. If you do more of them, and you, do, and you commit to them, you will be passionately pursuing Jesus Christ, and you will be given the tools that you need to fight the devil that he may flee. So there you have it, three ways to stay frosty. If you think about it, I'm sure you guys could find a few more. Maybe you've already developed your own methods or your own system for fighting temptation and being aware of the enemy's tactics. Here's the thing. Satan wants you desperately. He desires you with the intensity of, well, a roaring lion. He doesn't love you, but he covets you. He doesn't want you for any other reason other than to hurt God. That's all we are to him. Trophies in hell for eternity. He's like the safari hunter. He wants our head on that plaque. And he'll do anything he can to snare us, and to get us to bite. And this is the last thing we must remember before I close out. We have the power to defeat this enemy. If we have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and if we have invited him into our heart, and we have done that, guess what? He lives in us. We already have the victory. We just have to tap into it. We already have the ability to say yes to him and no to the temptation to stay frosty such that we don't fall, so that we can overcome. If you've invited Christ into your heart, you have the same spirit, Holy Spirit in you that was with Christ on the cross. Think about that. Jesus spent three days in hell after his death, and guess what? He overcame that. We have that power. All we have to do is flip the switch and turn it on. So, all we have to do is stay frosty to be aware of when he attacks. And if he hasn't, he will. And we will be ready. Stay frosty, people. You're in a fight. You are a member of God's army. You're on duty. Don't let your guard down. Because remember, he roams the earth like a prowling lion looking for someone to devour. And he wants it to be used. Don't let him get you. Stay frosty. And the church said... Thanks for watching. We would love for you to do two things. First, click the logo and subscribe to our channel. And second, like, comment, and share our videos with those whom you care about. We're always updating our page with the latest messages and original content. Thanks for watching.